This is the pre-lab for the experiment reactions of triphenylmethyl cation. In this video I will cover the pre-lab assignment, safety information, the goals of the experiment and the methods you will use to achieve them, some background information, details on conducting the experimental procedures, important information about cleaning up, and some information about analyzing the proton NMR spectra of the products. Prior to lab, you need to read all of the assigned sections in Techniques in Organic Chemistry and in your Organic Chemistry Lecture textbook. You also need to prepare your notebook. Make sure you follow the special instructions in your lab manual that describe how to organize your notebook for running the two separate reactions in the experiment. Two of the reagents you will use in this experiment, fluoroboric acid, which is sometimes referred to as tetrafluoroboric acid, and acetic anhydride are toxic and corrosive. You need to avoid breathing the vapors of these compounds and avoid skin contact. If you get either of these compounds on your skin, the affected area must be rinsed under running water for 10 minutes. To avoid breathing the vapors from these reagents, you'll carry out the second reaction, the tropillium ion synthesis, in the hood. The goals of this experiment are to synthesize two compounds. The first is the synthesis of methyl triphenylmethyl ether from triphenylmethanol. And the second is the synthesis of tropillium fluoroborate by the reaction of triphenylmethyl fluoroborate with cycloheptatriene. The methods you'll use in synthesizing methyl triphenylmethyl ether involve generating a solution of the trital cation by reaction of triphenylmethanol with concentrated sulfuric acid. That solution of the trital cation can then be reacted with methanol to form the ether. The product will be isolated by crystallization and characterized by melting point and proton NMR. To synthesize tropillium fluoroborate, you will prepare a solution of trital cation by reaction of triphenylmethanol with fluoroboric acid in acetic anhydride as a solvent. This produces a stable solution of the trital cation that can be reacted with cycloheptatriene to produce tropillium fluoroborate. The product can be isolated by crystallization and characterized by proton NMR. In the first reaction, triphenylmethanol is reacted with sulfuric acid to rapidly produce a bright yellow solution of the triphenylmethyl or trital cation. This cation is benzylic to three phenyl groups, which provide an extraordinary amount of stabilization so much so that this was the very first experimentally observed stable carbocation. While it's stable in sulfuric acid solution, it's still a reactive carbocation It'll, and it will undergo addition in the presence of many nucleophiles. In this case, we add the yellow solution to methanol. The methanol adds to the cation and methyl triphenylmethyl ether crystallizes out of the solution on cooling. There's some interesting things known about the trital cation. One is that the central carbon atom is sp2 hybridized, and thus the three carbons attached to it are coplanar and disposed at 120 degree angles. This places the phenyl groups very close together, and because of steric hindrance between the hydrogens closest to the cation, the three phenyl groups can't lie in one plane and are twisted, giving the entire structure a propeller shape. The second interesting thing is that the interaction of the pi systems of all three rings through the sp2 hybridized carbon at the center results in a relatively small energy gap between the highest occupied molecular orbital and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital of the species. The gap is sufficiently small that the ion absorbs light in the visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum and thus it appears colored to the eye. Depending on the solvent it's formed in, it'll appear anywhere from a red-brown to a yellow color. Here's some tips for executing the synthesis of methyl triphenylmethyl ether. The half milliliter of sulfuric acid can be measured with a Pasteur pipette. Inside the front cover of your copy of Techniques in Organic Chemistry is an actual size diagram of a long stem Pasteur pipette with approximate volume levels indicated. You can hold a pipette up to the diagram and mark the half milliliter level with a marker and then use that to dispense the acid. When the yellow solution of the trital cation is first added to the cold methanol, the yellow color should disappear and a white precipitate might immediately form. You will want to stir that mixture briefly to dissolve that initial precipitate. 
A few minutes later, you should see crystals of the product begin to form. If you don't observe crystals after about five minutes of cooling in an ice bath, use a glass stirring rod to scratch the wall of the tube at the liquid air interface to provide a nucleation site for crystallization to begin. Once the crystals do begin to form, you need to allow ample time for complete crystallization, about 15 to 20 minutes. When you clean up at the end of the experiment, place the filtrate from your filtration in the labeled waste container, rinse your glassware with a small amount of acetone, and allow it to dry thoroughly, and place your solid in the labeled waste container. The second reaction of the tritocation involves forming the tritocation by reaction of triphenylmethanol with fluoroboric acid in acetic anhydride as the solvent. There are a few important things going on here that allow you to make a stable solution of the tribal cation that you can subsequently react with cycloheptatriene. First is the use of fluoroboric acid as the proton source. It's a strong acid and it quickly and completely protonates the triphenylmethanol, which results in the loss of water in the formation of the trital cation. Just as important, its conjugate base, the fluoroborate ion, is non-nucleophilic. It won't add to the carbocation. It simply forms a salt with a cation. The second important thing is the acetic anhydride solvent that we use. Like most acid anhydrides, acetic anhydride hydrolyzes rapidly in the presence of water to form carboxylic acids. So, in addition to serving as the medium for the reaction, it quickly reacts with the water produced when the trital cation forms, converting it into acetic acid. This is important because water is a relatively strong nucleophile and could potentially add back to the trital cation, converting it back into the starting material. But acetic acid is a weaker nucleophile and doesn't add to the cation. Finally, we go to all this trouble to use fluoroboric acid and acetic anhydride because we can't use sulfuric acid like we did in the first reaction. The reason is that when we add cycloheptatriene, concentrated sulfuric acid would quickly convert it into tar-like decomposition products before it had a chance to react with the trital cation. So we need a different medium. Cycloheptatriene is an interesting hydrocarbon that will donate a hydride ion to a Lewis acid much more readily than most hydrocarbons. The reason lies in the transformation of the methylene group in cycloheptatriene into an sp2 hybridized carbon atom. This produces a planar, monocyclic, fully conjugated polyene possessing six pi electrons, a Huckel number, and a necessary condition for aromaticity. We call this seven-membered positively charged cation a tropilium ion. In this reaction, the hydride is transferred to the trital cation, converting it into triphenylmethane. And the tropilium ion is isolated as a salt with the fluoroborate anion. Here are some tips for executing the synthesis of tropilium fluoroborate. The acetic anhydride and diethyl ether can be measured with a marked pasture pipette, like the sulfuric acid in the first reaction. More accurate pipetters will be supplied for measuring the fluoroboric acid and the cycloheptatriene. When you clean up, place the organic solutions in the organic waste container and place the solid in the solid waste container. Both of the products in this experiment can be characterized by proton NMR, but the second product is especially interesting in that it gives us an opportunity to see how NMR can be used to diagnose aromaticity and anti-aromaticity. Hydrogen atoms directly attached to double bonds or to aromatic rings are especially deshielded by the magnetic field associated with the pi electrons. This gives rise to a chemical shift of around 5 to 6 parts per million for protons attached to alkenes and 7 to 8 parts per million for protons attached to benzene rings. The deshielding observed for aromatic rings, like benzene, is sufficiently large greater than two part per million more than the corresponding effect in alkenes, that its presence is generally accepted as evidence for aromaticity. We speak of this deshielding as resulting from an aromatic ring current. Something interesting happens when we go beyond benzene to apply the aromatic ring current test to larger annulenes. 
Anulenes are completely conjugated monocyclic hydrocarbons with more than six carbons. The compounds are denoted with a number in brackets before the name anuline that denotes the number of carbons in the ring. These structures are 18 anuline on the left and 16 anuline on the right. 18 anuline satisfies the Huckel 4n plus 2 pi electron rule for aromaticity, and many of its properties indicate aromaticity. As shown in the illustration, it contains two different kinds of protons. Twelve of those protons, shown in blue, lie on the ring's periphery, called outside protons, and six reside near the middle of the molecule, shown in red. They're called inside protons. The outside protons have a chemical shift of 9.3 parts per million, which makes them even less shielded than those of benzene. The six inside protons have a chemical shift of negative three, meaning they actually appear to the right of the TMS peak in the spectrum. As shown, both the shielding of the inside protons and the deshielding of the outside protons results from the same aromatic ring current. This induced field opposes the applied field in the center of the molecule and reinforces the applied field on the outside of the molecule, giving rise to the observed chemical shifts. Exactly the opposite happens with 16 anuline. Now it's the outside protons that are more shielded, their chemical shift is 5.3 parts per million, and the inside protons that are less shielded, their chemical shift is 10.6 parts per million. This reversal of shielding can only mean that the direction of the magnetic field is the reverse of that we observe in 18 anulene. Thus, 16 anulene, which has 4n pi electrons, is anti-aromatic. It not only lacks an aromatic ring current, its pi electrons produce exactly the opposite effect when placed in a magnetic field. Score one for Huckel.